So uh, now let's talk specifically about gluten. So gluten intolerance is the most common food-driven autoimmune disease. Approximately 10 to 35 percent of general population are genetically predisposed to gluten intolerance. So what it means is they carry specific genes which make them gluten intolerant. If we we'll look at mortality rate among patients who have gluten intolerance, so, oops, sorry about that. so it's approximately 1.9 to 3.8 above mortality rate of the general population, mainly because of malignancies. And we're talking about mainly lymphomas and colon cancer. And what's been shown that uh, if you start gluten-free diet uh, and you stay on pretty strict gluten-free diet somewhere between one to five years, your chance of getting uh, malignancies are going down to kind of regular baseline level. So, uh, and there are quite a few studies reflecting uh, this statement. And so gluten intolerance uh, is a disease of uh, intolerance for specific grain, so a disease which goes against the grain. And by definition, it's a permanent, a genetically based intolerance uh, to ingest gluten that results in chronic inflammation and various uh, systemic autoimmune responses. So this table shows you which grains uh, cannot be consumed by patients uh, who have gluten intolerance. So there are three main grains, so they include wheat, rye, and barley. And these are actually proteins which our body cannot tolerate when we have gluten intolerance. So gliadins in case of wheat, sacralins in case of rye, and cordains in case of barley. And yet there are some rare grains <coughs> which also cannot be consumed by patients who have gluten intolerance. So this is the list of these grains. Durum, spelt, triticale, camel, and nitrogen. So they have gliadin-like proteins. What it means is that these proteins can make it very similar to gluten and gliadins, and they can cause the same reaction in the body of uh, susceptible individuals. So why gluten? Uh, why not some other proteins? Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, human body, in, in general, cannot digest gluten. Our body doesn't have enzymes. And so when we consume gluten, uh, in, in, in the result of uh, digestion, uh, our body uh, forms uh, large fragments. So uh, these fragments, uh, they stimulate various uh, inflammatory processes, intestinal wall. What's been shown that these fragments can penetrate in the bloodstream and they can cause inflammation in distant organs, including thyroid gland, cerebral gland, brain, joints, and so on and so on. What's also been shown that uh, women who consume gluten excrete gluten peptides with their breast milk. And uh, this can affect newborns, and there are quite a few cases of newborns affected by celiac disease, and I've been asked how it would happen. Well, because uh, breast milk can contain gluten if mothers contain gluten-containing food well, on a regular basis. So, uh, again, uh, gluten intolerance is a genetic disease, uh, and approximately 15, 20 years ago, uh, major studies were published which showed that gluten intolerance is associated with uh, so-called HLA class 2 molecules. Uh, and if you have genetic predisposition and you don't consume gluten, you're not going to develop the disease. But if you do, obviously, you will develop the disease. So that's kind of the basis, the holy grail of gluten intolerance. So there are two main genes uh, which have been identified. Uh, one of them is called HLA-DQ2, and the second HLA-DQ8. Uh, and approximately, uh, it's been shown that 95% of people who have gluten intolerance they have one or both of these genes. So HLA-DQ2 is the main gene, approximately 85 to 90% of people with gluten intolerance and celiac disease. They have it, and HLA-DQ8 is a minor gene. And there are differences between uh, clinical manifestation of gluten intolerance uh, on the basis of the genes. If you have HLA DQ2, you're much more prone to diseases such as Schokan syndrome and lupus. If you have HLA DQ8, you're much more prone to osteoporosis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, how does it work? Why this genetic looks almost like a fatal? Well, uh, it's been shown that uh, if you have one of those genes, HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8, your immune cells or lymphocytes, specifically T lymphocytes, they express receptors. And so HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8 receptors. 
and these receptors can bind gluten. So uh, this reaction happens every time when you consume gluten if you have one or two of these genes. And the question is, what, why not always uh, consumption of gluten without the reaction? And the answer has been found uh, several years ago. What's been shown that people who have these genes, they have different density of receptors. And if your density is low, you may consume gluten, the reaction will happen, but clinically it will be very, very mild. So you may not notice it. But if you have uh, increased density of receptors, then consumption of gluten will result in serious side effects and inflammatory responses. Uh, lately, around three or four years ago, also it's been shown that patients who have severe forms of gluten intolerance and celiac disease, they have some extra genes which also can participate in the development of the pathological processes. One of them was identified as myosin 9 b gene, and what is interesting is that this gene is shared by patients who have colitis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. And this gene is, uh, is responsible for increased permeability of the gut and development of so-called leaky gut syndrome. So patients who have uh, myosin 9 b gene and one of the uh, HLA, DQ2, or DQ8, they have much, much higher risk of having severe forms of gluten tolerance or even celiac disease. There are a lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, in terms of what is celiac disease and how celiac disease is different from gluten intolerance. In general, celiac disease is a form of gluten intolerance. It's an extreme form of gluten intolerance. If you look at this slide, uh, only 3 or 5 percent of patients with actual gluten intolerance will develop celiac disease. And in general, uh, 6 to 7 percent of all people who carry these genes will be more or less asymptomatic during their lifespan, and approximately 30 or 35 will develop full blown gluten intolerance without celiac disease. In order to be diagnosed with celiac disease, you need to have the biopsy. You cannot have the diagnosis of celiac disease without intestinal biopsy. And that's the scale which shows different degrees of intestinal damage when you have celiac disease. What I want to mention is that uh, most of the patients who have gluten intolerance without celiac disease, they fall in the category 0 or 1 grade. And most of the patients who have full blown celiac disease, they go into grade 2, 3, and 4. So when you have celiac disease, inflammation in the gut is so extreme that it damages actual structure of the gut. And if you can see normal villous structure in the normal gut, the structure gets very atrophic and you have flattening of the villous structure. And that's something which can be picked up upon endoscopy. When you have normal structure of the villi, uh, again, your intestine will look normal, but it doesn't mean that you don't have gluten intolerance. That's the confusing portion, because quite often when you go to, an, uh, to, to a gastroenterology, you'll be scoped, and you can be told that, you know what, you have absolutely normal gut. That may be not the true, because anatomically it's normal, but functionally it's not. So don't confuse these two conditions. So gluten tolerance not only can result in various autoimmune problems, but it also results in metabolic problems, including malabsorption of vitamins, specifically D, A, E, K, B1, and B6, micro elements such as iron, calcium, magnesium, and micro elements such as zinc, copper, and selenium. Uh, quite often we see patients with leaky gut syndrome or uh, disease of increased gut permeability, pernicious anemia or B12 deficiency, osteoporosis, and severe dysbacteriosis with yeast overgrowth. These are all typical complications of gluten intolerance uh, in patients who are not on gluten-free diet. And let's finally talk about rheumatic diseases. So uh, this is a scope of diseases which we see quite frequently in patients who have gluten intolerance. They include Chogren syndrome, fibromyalgia, pseudogout, which is a disease of calcium deposition in the joints, osteoporosis, sacroiliitis, which is inflammation of the joint, uh, it's a junction between your pelvic bone and tailbone. Dermatomyositis, which is chronic inflammation of the muscle and skin, as well as psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, it's interesting to mention that approximately 30% of patients have psoriasis, they have gluten intolerance, and the skin condition can be almost completely cured uh, by gluten-free diet if they have the appropriate gene. 
So let's talk about Sjogren syndrome. Uh, the link between Sjogren syndrome and gluten intolerance was discovered in the early 90s. Uh, what's been shown that the majority of patients who have Sjogren syndrome, they express HLA DQ2 molecule, and that's the link between gluten and Sjogren syndrome. So what is Sjogren syndrome? It's an autoimmune disease affecting glands that produce tears and saliva. So uh, these are so-called parotid glands and lacrimal glands, glands producing tears. Uh, Sjogren syndrome is the most common autoimmune disease affecting humans. Uh, the damage of the glands can cause reduction in the quality and quantity of secretions. So the main symptoms include dry eyes and dry mouths, uh, also dry skin, absence of sweat, uh, and women quite often frequent yeast infections and vaginal dryness. So uh, the disease affects approximately 10% of women after menopause, and the ratio of women to men is 10 to 1, so disease affects mainly women. Uh, if disease is diagnosed early enough and uh, treated aggressively, it can be completely reversed. Uh, the late cases cannot be reversed and can be treated only symptomatically. So Sjogren syndrome can not only affect the glands, it can also affect joints and muscles. It can cause skin crackling due to the dryness, uh, chronic cough because it also can cause dryness within the bronchial tree, vaginal dryness as well as nerve damage causing tingling and numbness in the hands and feet as well as prolonged fatigue. Uh, the next condition which we frequently see in association with gluten intolerance uh, is fibromyalgia. So in general, fibromyalgia is not a disease. Uh, it's a more or less kind of scientific name for chronic pain uh, of unknown nature. But if you dig a bit deeper, you can find typically what's the driving force in most of the patients with fibromyalgia. Based on statistics in our clinic, approximately 20 to 25% of patients with fibromyalgia, they have issues with gluten and the disease can be fixed almost completely with appropriate diet. Again, if you look at the definition, uh, fibromyalgia is a disease of muscles and connective tissue of unknown origin and it results in chronic widespread pain uh, and painful response to a gentle or light touch. Again, it's not real disease, it's a syndrome of undiagnosed condition. So, a lot of patients uh, who have uh, fibromyalgia, they express typical symptoms of gluten intolerance, including fatigue, sleep disturbances, joint stiffness, uh, dryness, uh, problems with breathing, palpitations, uh, brain fog, and various cognitive dysfunctions. Uh, we're not uh, going to talk much about osteoporosis because we all know what it is. Uh, uh, the only thing which I need to mention is that in women who have osteoporosis, uh, checking for good and dormant should be a must because it can make a huge difference. Uh, and uh, again, osteoporosis by definition is a disease of low bone density and calcium loss uh, in trabecular bones. Uh, the disease is preventable by the right diet and is completely treatable with the right medications. Uh, finally, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about pseudo gout uh, because this is the condition which is well recognized by rheumatologists. But relatively unknown uh, in general practice. It's a condition where we deposit calcium pyrophosphate in various joints. So it is a form of arthritis, and quite often the presentation is very similar to gout. That's why we call pseudo gout. It's not real gout, it's a gout-like condition. So the disease presents in painful bouts of pain affecting knees, hands, and if it's less than treated, uh, it can destroy joints because calcium crystals, they grow inside of the joints, and it can completely destroy bones. Uh, knees are most often involved, but wrists, shoulders, ankles, elbows, and hands can be affected as well. Again, the most common cause uh, of student gout uh, in patients who have gluten tolerance is vitamin D deficiency and uh, elevation of so-called parathyroid hormone. Again, the disease, if it's due to gluten tolerance, completely treatable, and uh, you can make a huge difference by starting gluten-free diet.